old bastard. Fucking you hurt my shoulder, you laughing on. Fucking hell.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and may I welcome you all here today. My name is Tony Nolan, and I'm your funeral celebrant, and I have the honour of conducting the life celebration of Paul Wilkinson, who is known to most people as Wilco. The death of a loved one is a very sad occasion, but it is also a time to remember the joy and pleasure that that person brought into the lives of everyone that they knew. So therefore today we will celebrate and recall the special moments in the life of a special man, Wilco <coughs> Wilkinson. We begin today by recalling events that happened in 1956, when the world was a very different place from what it is now. The first ever Eurovision Song Contest was held. Premium bonds were introduced in the UK. And famous people such as Tom Hanks and Mel Gibson were born. And another special event occurred in that year, when, on the 20th of June, Paul Wilkinson was born in Hope to his mum, Audrey, and his dad, Gordon, who was known as Jack, when they were living in King's, Be in King's Bench Street. He was brought up with his older sister, Angela, and then, ten years later, another sister appeared, who is Heather. After primary school, Paul went to Kingston High. Although he was very bright, he wasn't really keen on school, apart from English and art. And Paul claimed he managed to get a mark in a French exam just for putting his name on the paper. Since being a youngster, Paul was always very accident-prone, but possibly some were avoidable. Examples include jumping off a bin in the backyard when he landed on some metal, and swinging on the door handle, losing his grip, and going through the glass panel of the door. Both of these happened on bank holidays, just before a family outing. So his mum spent her day off in the hospital and said they had their own seat in A&E. Other incidents included a brick on the forehead when he popped his head up at the wrong time. A motorbike crash where he ended up with metal plates, ankle to hip in both legs. A broken leg after slipping whilst helping to clean a garden pond. Shoulder, hand and eye injuries whilst trying to pick up a drunk out of the road. The car went into the helpers, whereas the drunk just got a hangover. And, as you shall hear later, a car crash on the way to a football match, which all left Paul being held together with stitches and bits of metal. Growing up as a teenager in the late 60s, early 1970s, Paul was very proud of his long hair at the time. He also had a few questionable fashion items, including platform shoes, very flared jeans, and an African coat, that his mum would not let in the house, as it smelled so terrible. <laughs> so he had to stay in the garage, along with his ferrets. Paul loved animals, and along with his ferrets, possibly the most well-known of his pets was Lippy. He was a lurcher, who got his name from a mouthful of snaggled teeth, which curved over his lips. Well, we, Wilco never intended to get a dog at the time, but during a card game with some people he'd met, he won the hand, and his prize was Lippy. He loved that dog, and when Lippy was knocked down by a car, Paul stayed, with him up, stayed up with him all night, nursing him back to health, and was devastated when Lippy finally passed away a few years later. Paul was an amazing artist, and in his younger days used to paint the fuel tanks of friends' motorbikes, usually with heavy metal motifs. He also used to enjoy painting in oils, but could sketch a caricature or cartoon with just the byro. However, he also learnt to sew during one of his hospital stays when he was around 22 and in traction for six months. He completed a stuffed hedgehog toy that his sister Heather still fondly has today. Heather also remembers that her brother wasn't the greatest at remembering birthdays and getting Christmas presents, but when he did, they could be memorable. On Boxing Day one year, he arrived at his mum's house and handed her a combined Christmas and birthday present as her birthday was the 28th of December. It was a five-week-old Yorkshire Terrier puppy, whose mother had been owned by a friend of Paul's and had died in an accident. Audrey sat there with a tiny fluffy ball that sat in the palm of her hand, and she called her Kim. Luckily, she already had a dog, and had some, some things in for her, as Boxing Day wasn't the best for getting supplies in. And Kim lived well into her teens, and was probably his mum's most loved pet. Throughout his life, being very sociable, Paul knew all sorts of people. Once Heather recalls coming home from Polytechnic and talking about a brilliant band that she had seen, 
called the Fine Young Cannibals, whose lead singer came from home. His name was Roland Gibb. When his sister was telling him, Paul immediately replied, Roland, oh yeah, he's a mate of mine. I was out for a pint with him the other week. Heather still remembers she could have easily quite happily throttled him. What use is an elder brother if they don't introduce him to nice, famous friends? To his family, he was known as Paul, but to his friends, he was always Wilco. And as most of them know, when you went around to Wilco's house, you never quite knew what you may find. <coughs> as Heather remembers, during one visit, when they tripped to the bathroom, revealed a bath full of live eels. She never did get an explanation of what they were doing there or where they had come from. It wasn't likely to be from a successful fishing trip, as Wilco's fishing boat was named Irwell. The explanation being that if something went wrong, as it did frequently, such as sinking, shoulders would be shrugged and it was a case of Irwell. But he did enjoy his fishing, which was often off the side of the docks. Although he and a pal did once get stranded on the sandbank whilst fishing on the River Humber. In his late teenage years, when living on Hawthorne Avenue, Wilco met a lady called Sue, and they became lifelong friends. At the time, he knew some Hells Angels who lived nearby. He liked to hang around with them. Wilco didn't have a motorbike until an accident on it left him in traction for months. Sue fondly remembers going to lots of music concerts with him in the 1980s, including watching bands such as Black Sabbath and Thin Lizzy at the Bridlington Spa. Of course, loved going to festivals such as Donington. And every year, he went to the famous one at Glastonbury if he could. He mainly went with his great friend Les Hodge, and loved the whole experience on offer. Wilco always loved his music, either listening to it or going to concerts with his friends with one of the most memorable and fantastic ones, according to his good friend Kerry, was at the Hull City Hall, where they were all mashed out whilst watching the band Levelers. Paul clearly left his family and friends with many happy memories, and we shall hear some more soon. But for now, it may be a suitable time to pause for a moment of reflection and to recall your own personal memories of Wilco as we listen to a song by one of his favourite bands, The Levelers, called What a Beautiful Day. Thank you. 
I'm sure that Wilco would appreciate the fact that many people here have worn the colours of Hull City because since being a youngster he was a huge supporter of the club and a man collector of football programmes. This led him following the Tigers home and away all over the country with his close friends. When the organised Wilco would make all the travel and payment arrangements, recording everything in one of his little black books. They always had lots of fun on their trips, whatever the result, with Kerry fondly recalling one to Carlisle, when they stopped in Penrith and had a great time playing killer pool with some locals, when the landlord let them smoke their special herbal cigarettes, <laughs> as long as Wilco and his pals shared them with him. However, on one away trip in 2001 to Macclesfield to watch the Tigers play, they were involved in a car crash, which left Wilco badly injured. During his long recovery period, his friends nominated him for the Hull City Supporter of the Year award, which he won. However, he didn't believe it at first, and they had to get someone from the club to phone him to confirm it. The award was the first one after they moved to the new KC Stadium. For the presentation, Wilco wore a collar and tie, clothing he was not used to and was panicking about. So when he arrived, all dressed up, and was asked if he was a visiting director, Wilco was delighted. <laughs> he was there for any City match if he could, with the biggest one being the Championship playoff final at Wembley in 2008, to which Wilco arrived late for the kick-off, as he got stuck on the London Underground with some pals. Like all Tigers fans, after winning that match, Wilco was delighted that his beloved club had been promoted to the Premier League for the first time in their history. And he enjoyed watching them in the top division. Arguably, he loved more going around the smaller clubs and day trips to places like Yeovil. Heather said that when her sons, Ethan and Nat, were born, her brother gained two nephews and immediately started them on the Hull City Road beginning with City Baby Grows and Teddy Bears. They both went to matches with him and got kitted out in full kit. Paul also got his brother-in-law, John, into the team. And on numerous occasions, Heather would get a phone call to say that John had been kidnapped and he was staying out for a drink. It always ended with John rolling in the worse for wear and complaining he couldn't get away. Enjoying a drink, a smoke and socialising on those days out, was something that Wilco adored. And amongst those who joined him were his very good friends, Terry and Carpet. They have some wonderful memories of their special pal, so I'd now like to invite them forward to share a few with us all. <laughs> First of all, we told them. <laughs> 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 yeah, might as well. We'll do it later. Tony's already nicked most of our best stories. We told him all this the other night to give him an idea of what Wilco was like. We didn't think he was going to repeat us every word we told him. <laughs> no heckling, no heckling. Please. Bad enough as it is. It, Wilco would love this. The turnout from so many of his friends. Lifelong friends in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. It was over there, and when you went to Macclesfield in the crash, <laughs> what did you say to you when at, at the crash? Tony alluded it to it earlier on him getting out of the um, hospital. Did we win? Was the first thing he said when he woke <laughs> up. And the story went round was, did we win? Had to be the nominate for the player of the year. And we was there with him. It was when he got 
present the presentation and he was walking around like a cock of a walk. You <laughs> just won't believe it. I've known I've known him about 45 years. The first time I met him, I thought he was a, an annoying little twat. <laughs> <laughs> Playing darts, three tons down the road there. I just started going in, 25, 26 year old, playing darts at the team. But the match was off that night, so the team was at home, we were just playing darts among ourselves, and Wilco sat down there with a bunch of his mates, one or two of them I can still see here, gets up and forces his way into having a game of darts with us, and the little twat beat me. <laughs> never forgiven him for it, never forgiven him for it. It started a friendship that lasted till the, end. till the end. It was just great, right? Take over for a minute. Let me just compare this. <laughs> I've got up to the bit where I know him. Yeah, I'll take my glasses off so I can see. <laughs> well, I was going to say a few words, but it fits up. So I was in his flat with Louise and Kerry. And I found a letter what he was so proud of and he's kept it for a long time. It was someone he wrote off for a job to. <laughs> and this was the reply he got in the letter. I'll read it out to you. <laughs> to, whom, to whom it may concern, this letter is that to verify Mr. Paul Wilkinson called in today to seek employment at our company, Phoenix Careers. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we do not have any vacancies, but we will keep him on, on a record. On anything should it come up in the near future, we'll contact Mr. Wilkinson. <coughs> to be honest, he looks a right lazy shite. <laughs> he doesn't have a day's work in him. I couldn't believe how small this guy was. <laughs> he wouldn't be able to see over the dashboard. <laughs> Let alone get in the vans. Do <laughs> we need to carry a set of steps with him all day? <laughs> Please kindly note that we have deleted him off our potential candidates list. <laughs> As he has got a net, not got a hell, cat in hell chance of ever finding work here. <laughs> this man is scary. He looks like the child catcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> For fuck's sake, how would he be expected to collect and deliver at schools? Children. <laughs> He would scare the shite out of them. <laughs> anyway, good luck, Mr. Wilkinson, with, with some other sucker. <laughs> Don't call again, because I'm having nightmares about you. <laughs> Can regards and get fucked, <laughs> Simon Moss. I'll throw every word of that as well. <laughs> anyway, I've said my bit, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> you can see we're all wearing city, city shirts. <laughs> Phew. That's one of the first things that got me and Wilkes as mates talking about city. Outside having a smoke at the same time when we got onto it, but we found we had. Similar interests, so we got mates for the best of our lives. But we travelled, watching City from literally one end of the country to the other. We had some immense laughs and some bad times along the way, let's put it like that. We'd go camping. I was just going to say, 
Darts team. He formed a darts team from Malt Shovel. We never won a game. <laughs> we was always pissed by nine o'clock. We usually used to leave at five in the morning to get home. And a few times they wouldn't even let us in the pub. <laughs> that I loved about Wilco was the stuff he loved to collect. Obviously we all know about his fascination with Hull City, everything, memorabilia and all such. But like it's been already said, if you ever went round his house, it was like travelling round the world. There's so many objects he had from all over the world. Mad things that people had brought him. I brought him some when I was away from down in West Africa, a little wooden doll. He didn't like it, so he had to take it back off him. He wouldn't have it in the house. He said it was, had a spirit about it, and he wouldn't have it in the house first at all. But one of the things I loved about the stuff that he collected, and forgive me for saying it's like all you lot here, he had some strange bits and pieces. By <laughs> far and away, the biggest collection he had was his friends. He counted on his friends as the best thing that he ever had in his life. And we'll miss him all the more for that because we loved him in so many different ways. All of us have got a story to tell about our, our Wilco. Our Paul, as I had to call him in front of his mother. <laughs> right. right. You take over now. I wish I could tell you a thousand and more things about Wilco, but you can all do that among yourselves later on in the mall. Yeah. We'll see you all down there. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Terry and Carpet, for that special tribute. Terry also fondly remembers the legendary FA Cup finals every year. And around 18 of their friends crammed into Wilco's house on Pretoria Street to watch the match in a wonderful atmosphere, which was created by what they were drinking and smoking. <laughs> Wilco clearly touched the lives of many people, as shown by the numbers who have gathered here to pay their respects. And another tribute has been paid by his friend Simon, who has written the following message. Wilco, now where the hell do we start? I really still can't believe what's happened. And it still hasn't sunk in that you are no longer by our sides. Going to miss your stupid laugh, our city away days, our jollies out, our camping adventures, our times in the pub, but most of all you just being one of a kind. I walk in the pub now, it just doesn't seem right you not being there. Sat next to your wife, Carpet Kev. <laughs> Ever down. You always had a bloody good laugh with all your friends by your side. You live life to the max, and that's something nobody can take away from you. I think one of the biggest memories that stands out for me was when we were camping at Salter's Gate Pub, and you got into a little tiff with Dave Hall. And then, from nowhere, you pulled out a length of burning timber and proceeded to lamp him on top of the head. And you just simply laughed. At the time, it was quite serious, but we all laughed the next day when there was a great big stain of charcoal right across Dave's head. <laughs> we all just laughed and it was forgotten about. Also remember the time at Leeds train station when me and you ended up at the wrong platform with minutes to spare before our train left. And then we got lost again, with you cursing at me and me just laughing at you to, to trying to run with me. Oh, you wasn't a happy chappy. I could go on forever, but we would be here all day. 
The laughs, the tears, the arguments, and sometimes really funny arguments. But the memories and love for you, I will click close to my heart and mine forever. You will never be forgotten, my friend. Well, how could anyone ever forget you? You touched so many people you didn't even know. Nobody we knew ever had a bad word against you. Today will be a very sad day for everyone. Now sadly, we need to let you go in peace and fly high, our friend, our brother, our nutter. We love you, Wilco. We always will. Until we meet again, from your broken-hearted friend, Simon. Thank you very much, Simon. who was close to Wilco is his long-standing girlfriend, Debbie. And when they first got together, Wilco naturally took her to watch Hull City play. And after Debbie, Debbie told him she thought she enjoyed it, Wilco told her he would keep taking her until she really liked it. <laughs> they enjoyed going out for a drink together. Wilco always took her out for Christmas dinner. He loved eating out at Mr Chew's. And every New Year, Wilco and some friends liked celebrating in different places which over the years included London, Dublin, Amsterdam, Prague and Sofia. <coughs> like everyone here, Debbie will dearly miss him. She has written the following lovely tribute to him. Wilco is a bright star that twinkled everywhere and on us all. How lucky are we all? Wilco was always there to give his kindness and help. That's just Wilco. That bright, bright star, I'm sure, is still sparkling on upon us all. You all we all love him, just as he does us. Don't say goodbye, because Wilco is a legend that will live on in our hearts forever. Thank you very much, Debbie. As I mentioned earlier, Wilco loved music which is often of the rock or heavy metal variety. Therefore, it may come as a surprise to some to hear that when he heard the following piece taken from the opera Gianni Schicci, when it was sung on the TV show Britain's Got Talent, Paul burst into tears. So, please think of him once more as we listen to that song, which is called O Mio Babino Caro, sung by Amira Willig Hagen.
I'm sure that many of you here will have shared a drink with Wilco in pubs such as the Malt Shovel, in which he loved playing darts. He played for various teams, including at the Three Tons. And Wilco organised the teams, playing alongside his friends, using his famous little black book. When he was once having a drink with carpets in a silver cord, he was upset to find out that the barmaid called Tina had been diagnosed with cancer. She knew him well and called him silly old Wilco. At times, she put on everyone. <coughs> so Wilco decided to organise a charity football match to raise funds to help Tina and to give her and her family a little holiday to get away from it all. This was the start of his many fundraising efforts and possibly his proudest moment in life was when Wilco helped to set up the Silly Old Tina Fund, which raised lots of money for the local community, which includes paying for a defibrillator outside of the malt shovel, which has already been used many times to save people's lives. <laughs> this also provided needed funds to a local boxing club, and bought an electric scooter for a resident of Anleby Road, amongst many other things, with the aim of the Silly Old Tina Fund being to help local people all folk in the hour of need, by helping them in any way they can, which Wilco and his friends have certainly done. Carpet remembers when they organised a cowboy night at Brownies to raise funds for the family of a young guy who drowned at sea. They took over the pub, and Wilco found a singer from Bridlington to entertain people. And to promote the evening, they came up with advertising posters that said, One night with Chuck Wilkins even though the singer's name was something like Eric. <laughs> as well as attracting lots of people and became his friends, Wilco also attracted many animals. As well as his dog Lippy, he had a cat called Stumpy and a chicken named Dennis, which Carpet bought for him. <laughs> Wilco, who was handy, made a hutch for Dennis, while she used to sit on the back of Wilco's head as he watched TV. As Dennis spent time in the house, when Wilco tried to make his own wine, using some grapes that a friend called Julia grew, and crushed them by standing on them using his feet, <laughs> on the floor where the chicken had been walking, <laughs> and doing other things, the end result wasn't that great. In fact, his friends who tried the wine joked it tasted foul, which it did. In 2014, Wilco and his friend Sue decided they were in a position to live the dream and move to Spain and the Costa Blanca region. They made many good friends there, some of whom used to drive them about so they could see different places. They also walked for miles, and it wasn't long before Wilco set up the Four O'Clock Club, where people got together to enjoy a few drinks. <laughs> Due to accumulating lots of metal in his injury hit body, Wilco felt the cold, so he liked the warmth that Spain offered, until they had to return to Hull in 2017. Three years later, Sue and himself managed to go back to Spain, but the timing was unfortunate due to the arrival of the Covid lockdown. They were isolated out there for about eight months before returning home once more. But Sue and Wilco were pleased that they got to share a great experience. When he came back home, Wilco signed on. As they loved playing pranks on each other, Carpets got his friend Lisa to ring Wilco up to say she was from the job centre and they had a couple of interviews he had to attend, which Wilco managed to stave off, although he did work when he chose to as a self-employed painter and decorator. When he wasn't home, Paul enjoyed watching war and history films. His house on Pretoria Street has been described by his friends as an Aladdin's cave, reminiscent of the sitcom Step Two and Son because he hoarded many things. <coughs> Amongst his acquisitions was a very large build your own model of HMS Victory, which he bought about ten years ago. Even though it cost him a, a fortune, Wilco liked to try and put it together and paint bits of it. Despite having it for so long, he never finished it. <coughs> Jim didn't understand his nephew Ethan is going to take it over to try and complete it. He always had it in of Harry Bows out at home to share with visitors, of which, there was all, of which there were always many, as Wilco would generously give a bed to anyone who was in need, and he would do anything for anybody if he could. Wilco continued to enjoy spending time with his many friends, having a drink and going on lots of camping trips over the years, including to North Yorkshire and Gothland on Green Grasses Farm. 
and another memory they have of him is that most of Wilco's clothes had racing burns in them as he did enjoy smoking a spliff whilst having a drink of his favourite John Smith's. His friends have described Wilco as a truly intelligent man who got to do the most stupid and daft things sometimes. On occasions he could be prickly, and as Terry said, he could be a twat. <laughs> but he was their twat, and they loved him to bits. They will really miss him. They've told me that the malt shovel won't be the same again. Without seeing him there, sat in his little spot, at the back near the toilets, holding court. And he will leave a gap in lots of people's lives. Although he suffered with various health issues over the years, which he usually kept to himself, on top of the ones caused by his accidents. Recently everything seemed fine with Wilco, as he was still going to the football and doing some bits of painting. He then contracted pneumonia, and was sent home by the hospital, even though he wasn't well, as his friends Lou and Simon discovered when he came across him one day on Anlaby Road. Despite the obvious need to return to hospital for treatment, Wilco wouldn't go back until they took him to the malt shovel for one last pint. Which wasn't a surprise, as his favourite phrase in the pub, one of the few he learned when, whilst living in Spain, was uno mas, which meant I'm having one more. After this, Wilco did go to the whole royal infirmary. He was there on the 15th of April, when he suddenly and very sadly passed away. But he will never be forgotten by everyone who had the privilege of meeting him. <clears throat> At this part of the service, it is often traditional to say a prayer like the Lord's Prayer. But his close friend suggested that the following may be more in line with the wonderful character that he was. And so this has been renamed as Wilco's Prayer. Our lager, which art in barrels, hallowed be thy drink. Thy will be drunk, I will be drunk, a term as I am in the tavern. Give us this day our foamy head, and forgive us our spillages, as we forgive those who spill against us. And lead us not into incarceration, but deliver us from hangovers. <laughs> For thine is the beer, the John Smiths and the Spliffs. <laughs> Forever and ever will come. Barman. <laughs> Thank you. As you leave here today, there will be a collection box. And any proceeds, should you wish to make a donation, will be sent in Wilco's name to the silly old Tina Fund. His family and friends would like to invite you all to join them after this ceremony at the Malt Shovel Pub to further celebrate Wilco's life. May I thank everyone for coming here today, and please have a safe journey home. And could I now ask if you're able to please stand for the committee. <laughs> You closed your eyes and have gone away and left us to understand. Others have gone, this we know, but you were ours and we loved you so. You'll be in our thoughts every day, in our hearts and you will always stay. A private reflection and a tear or two, we will always love and miss you. Go with our love, we understand. Go with our loving back to the land. It is now time to say our final goodbyes to Paul Wilkinson, a wonderful character and a free spirit who will be greatly missed by all those who knew and loved him. So as we leave here, please think of Wilco once more as we listen to a song which he actually requested to be played here today. And this is Road to Nowhere sung by one of his favourite bands, Talking Heads.